We're joined by the member for McKellar, Liberals, Jason Falinski, and Labor Senator Deb O'Neill. Thanks so much How for you, being here. Yeah, great to talk See to you. Josh. Uh, well, Jason, Joe, of course. Jo well, thank you very much. Thanks <laughs> for including me. <laughs> All right. That's right. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Let's be nice at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, Jason, we should probably start with you. Not a, not a, not you a don't great... have to if you don't want to. It's not, I, I'm sure you'd rather we didn't, but uh, oh, not no. necessarily a great look for the, for the government with uh, two more people jumping ship. What's wrong? Well, why do you think something's wrong? I... Well, why is everyone leaving? Well, in the case of Christopher, can I say... Um, that I just don't think the parliament's going to be the same. Um, Chris, there, there is no one else in the lower house, at least. Maybe in the Senate, there's lots of people who can turn a debate about um, whatever bill into remind us that this is what uh, King Charles I faced <laughs> in the Civil War, um, and that's Christopher, and uh, he will be sorely missed. But he's been a member for 26 years, and. Um, Last year he turned 50, and I, I think that's a national security issue I've just breached. So if uh, black clad ninjas come in here, don't worry, they're after me. Um, and his father died when he was 52, and I think that gave Christopher pause to think about what he wants to do with um, his remaining time. And uh, I think he wanted to get out while he still had time to for a second um, for a second career. But he will be very sorely missed and there are a few people who get to make the sort of contribution he's made in politics. More broadly this does add, his resignation does add to a long list of Liberal ministers mm. and MPs who have announced they are retiring and the end of the week has, has ended with people talking about you know is this people reaching for life rafts or jumping from a sinking shift mm. ship as we're heading towards a federal election is that what's happening? Sure I think that it's easy for people to try and draw sort of incorrect correlations but I think there's an underlying cause and you've seen on both sides of um, parliament uh, the Labor Party in the lower house has had a number of resignations. I listened to a number of valedictory speeches. Wayne Swan, uh, Kate Ellis, uh, Jenny Macklin, Tim Hammond left earlier, uh, and there have been a number of others. Um, I think that uh, we all choose to be in this life, so it's not a complaint, but it's an observation, and I've only been here for two years, but parliamentary life can be very gruelling, and Deb and I were talking about that just in the green room or the hallway, I suppose. Um, that you know, it's it's a lot of time away from friends and family. Um, it is uh, a public service, and you have to be willing to serve. And I think, in fairness to the nation and to your electorate, um, when you've decided that you don't have it in you any longer, it's the right thing to say. You know, I'm going to bow out and let someone else do it. Deb, you're from the opposite side of politics as, <laughs> as Jason Absolutely. is. Absolutely, uh, it's a big difference. Of the of the ministers <laughs> who were sworn in under Tony Abbott, more than 60 percent have either left politics or been dumped from the front bench or are planning to leave yep. Parliament. Nearly 40% of Malcolm Turnbull's post-2016 election ministry has retired. It's not dissimilar on your side of politics. Eight Labor MPs won't recontest the next poll. What's happening? Well, what we've seen is a divided and dysfunctional government falling apart before our very eyes. We've got the captains of the ship jumping. Uh, Pine, the fixer, has figured out that it's time to pick up his tools and walk away because even he has given up on any any hope of fixing well, this Well, why are eight Labor decay. MPs not recontesting well, the next the, well. If you have a look and you compare, you'll see there's a retirement schedule for many of those people who've been in there for a very long time. But these are senior leaders of the current government who cannot stand the toxic culture that is their government. They have broken one another within this government. They've certainly lost focus on the Australian people and they are just all about fighting one another. They stopped governing a very, very long time ago. And Matthias Cormann, I understand, is the only shadow, uh, only minister who's in his, st still retains his current role. So, you know, for five years we've seen this government tear itself apart and we've got one person in their current role. They talk about standing up for small business. Any small business that had that kind of a turnover across this country would not survive. And, and the Australian people know it. This is a government in absolute absolute chaos and meltdown. Well, Jason Falinski, is this a depleted team going into the federal election when you're having to replace key figures like Steve Chobo in his position? I know um, Christopher Pine will stay on in his position, but there are really key roles that are going to need to be replaced just, you know, weeks, months out from a federal election. Yeah, uh, Joe, um, that's a good point. Uh, Steve Chobo is being replaced by Linda Reynolds, the first brigadier in the uh, first female brigadier in the um, army. It means that we now have a record number of women in cabinet. Um, so that's something that I think we should celebrate today. Um, no, I think ultimately any organisation to disagree humbly with, um, uh, with Deb, any organisation needs a level 
of um, being refreshed, needs new ideas and new people to be, com to be coming in. There is no doubt that replacing Christopher Pine will be very difficult. He is um, probably once in a generation person in our parliament. Um, it is a shame that he was going. I wish he wasn't. But he's been there 26 years and he's made a personal choice. And I think he's made a choice on the basis that he feels he cannot serve his electorate as he would like to and his nation as he would like to, because after 26 years, he's I, I don't know. He's he's on at 9.30 and I'm sure he'll give us his uh, reason for it. What we've seen here with these ministers is they know a, two or thing, a thing or two about Mr Morrison and the government that he hopes to lead after the election. And what we've seen is people who know what's going on inside this government, people at the highest level, are making a choice. They're getting out right now. because. We, what we see day after day in Canberra is the chaos and division manifesting itself, not just in the infighting within the Liberal National Party itself, not just with the resignations of O'Dwyer, Keenan, Scullion, Bishop, Chobo, Pine, Laundie's going to go next, and I expect there will be more. There is considerable conversation around Canberra about other senior Liberals well, who will be walking away. Jason Polinsky spoke about a, you know, a fresh a team, a fresh approach. Often when people are appointed to new positions, they get a honeymoon period. Could this actually be threatening to Labor at the next election? Mr Morrison has lost people who have seen that he's failed in the role that he's undertaking, that he and his party are completely out of touch with what's going on for the Australian people, who see everything, the cost of living going up day after day, their wages not growing. They see incredible interference going on in the education sector. We see lies being told about health right across the nation, fear campaigns being run day after day. This is a government that has stopped governing and the people who know what's going on are walking away in shame and disgust, I expect, at what they've had to be a part of under Mr Morrison, the third Prime Minister in five years from a completely dysfunctional government. Are you saying that their concern is primarily about the way that, that Scott Morrison is handling the Prime Ministership and not a concern about the overall revolving door of the Prime Ministership and the position that the party finds itself in? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually get some clarity on that, Josh, at the moment? Well, of it's course, just of course, total I mean, chaos. I'm, I, don't, I don't expect a retiring senator to tell me exactly why they're retiring. I expect the platitudes about spending more time with, with your family. But are you, uh, just to clarify, are you saying that, that, that this reflects poorly on Scott Morrison's leadership uh, specifically? Absolutely, it does. This is the man who cannot keep the team of experienced people around him. They are running away from Scott Morrison. There's a few hints there for the Australian people. Labor is a united team by, co by, by contrast. And, uh, you know, we don't have to sort of make a song and dance about putting women in positions of responsibility like we see the government you know, scratching at something today. All right. We have nearly 50% of women and we've got that talent. We do there have to move to on, but a quick reply from Jason. Well, I, I just want to say, Josh, I, you know, I understand that there's cynicism because um, so many other members of uh, parliament, both here and overseas, when they've done something wrong, say, I'm retiring to spend time with my family. But Tim Hammond, who was a Labor member from Western Australia, um, in, in the week before he decided that he wasn't coming back, he and I just happened to have a conversation where he said, you know, I've got a young family. I haven't seen them for five weeks because I'm flying in and out of WA and I've got committee work and I'm a shadow minister. And so when he resigned a week later, I just wasn't surprised by that. I mean, members of parliament are human beings and it is actually very difficult in some instances for them to maintain a proper work-life balance. And so it, it, in many cases it is actually a sincere reason, but I understand why some people would be cynical. Yeah, and, I, and to, be, to clarify, I, I wasn't actually agreeing with Deb that, that, oh, this, no, that no, this reflects no, poorly on the PM necessarily. There's yes, a whole no, conjunction no, yeah. of factors which would make it plausible as to why someone wouldn't want to be in Canberra anymore yeah. at the moment if they're in the coalition. Well, can we just move on, mm, uh, sure. just move on, on uh, quickly because yeah. you know, what, the other big new political news of the, of the week, of course, was that, that uh, Peter Dutton said that, that the, the possibility of refugees having to access health care in Australia yeah. could put pressure on our healthcare facilities and then the yes. Prime Minister reiterated that, that claim. There are about a thousand people on Manus and Nauru. Yes. About 70 of them need medical care. We have 695 public hospitals. We have 62,000 hospital beds. Yeah. What's he talking about? Well, sort of great, great question. question. <laughs> so the answer we agree, that, Jason. Um, the, uh, I think what both the Prime Minister and the Minister are saying is that there is obvious... The thing about healthcare is you could never have enough of it. Um, the more healthcare you supply, the greater the demand um, cut becomes for it. So um, no matter how many hospitals or how much funding we put in healthcare, there's always going to be a need for more. If you then put more people 
um, into that system. 70 might, people well, out of we, 62,000 beds. Exactly. I think their issue is they don't know. The issue is... Well, even if it was all 1,000. Sorry? Even if it was all 1,000 that, That's absolutely right. I mean, axiomatically, it's going to put more pressure on the healthcare system that we have in Australia. Are you therefore also saying that doctors can't make that decision about health priorities and mm. and who to, to give a priority based on uh, yeah. medical reasons? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's... Well, the problem with the Medivac bill, as it got past the Parliament and the Senate, um, is that it doesn't allow doctors to make that. So all the, the doctors have to make a yes-no decision around whether the person should come to Australia for further assessment, not treatment, just assessment. So to Josh, to your point is, all 1,000 might come to Australia just for assessment and be assessed as being fine. Um, but the question that we have is we don't know how many people might actually then need treatment after that. No, but look, a, a, a fence collapsed at a footy game last night at Leichhardt Oval in Sydney. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt. If yes. that had been worse and 70 people had been seriously yes. injured, is is the Prime Minister saying that the Australian healthcare system would have crumbled under the weight of treating those 70 well, people? Well, I don't think he's saying that at all, is he? Where's he well, said it sounds that well, he's saying like that 70 it. refugees requiring treatment is going to put undue pressure on the on the Australian healthcare system. Well, did well he... how would that be different than if 70 people I'm... were just injured in an accident? Josh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Peter Dutton say that it would that these 70. Pe... Well, number one, I don't think he was talking about 70. He was saying we don't know how many. Number two, I don't think he was saying the healthcare system in Australia will collapse because of a thousand people. I think what he's saying is that it will create pressure in the system. I don't think he even used the word undue. Uh, but if you can point me to that, I'll, I'll humbly, you know. Submit well, why raise well. it if all he's saying is that it's going to put some kind of vague but not particularly important pressure because on the we, system? Because that's the point about this bill. We don't know. We just don't know. I mean, David Coleman has stood up day after day after day and said, as we read through this bill, we find that there are there's another loophole. Another. So, for example, we did... Sorry, Joe. That's fine. <laughs> so we, we're, on, we're running out of time. Yeah, I want I'm to give Deb O'Neill a very quick reply. Um, is this going to put uh, unfair pressure on the health system? No, and I think, Josh, you've just poked holes in the ridiculousness of the statement that we've seen from Minister Dutton. It's fear-mongering on steroids. He's continuing to push out this myth about the threat. Uh, we've got to remember that Peter Dutton was given the title of being the worst health minister in living memory, um, if the government not, has not by presided... Not <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a general award, I think. Um, but, uh, look, seriously, g given the, the state of this nation, with 25 million people, if we cannot, if this government has presided over such a period that it's impossible for us to look after a couple of dozen people, we're, we're in Deb, is your mob going to go into this, into this election with positive solutions for the country, or are you just going to keep talking like this about how bad the government is? Well, I don't think you would find a government that's gone forward with solutions and policy more explicit than the Labor Party in recent times. We have put our policies out there and we will build a country that's for all Australians, that's fair. Okay. With regard to border security, we'll make sure that we maintain our border security, that we turn back boats when it's safe to do so, okay. that Australian sovereignty is not under threat. But we'll make sure that there's no egregious lies of the kind that we've seen that are populate All right. the, the political discussion. Unfortunately, I'm the referee here and unfortunately we have <laughs> run out of time this I morning. But thank you both for coming in this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.